Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Our webinar today is Building the Foundation for Energy Resilient Communities, Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Funding Program's 2022 Impact. And we have a really wonderful group of panelists with us today. Um, before I pass it over to them, I'd like to go over some very quick uh, webinar logistics. Uh, if you would like to minimize your webinar control panel so that you can view the presentation full screen, you can click on the orange arrow that you see circled here, and you can also click on that little orange arrow to expand your webinar console. One thing that you may like to do with your webinar console is to type in your questions and your comments. We will be saving about uh, 20 minutes or so for a Q&A at the end of our webinar and we would love to answer as many questions as you have. So please do type those in when you think of them. Um, this webinar is an hour and a half today. So that will be, um, so you know timing wise, uh, where we'll be at in that time. So about 20 minutes towards the end Q&A. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and we will post slides and a recording today or tomorrow on Clean Energy Group's website at cleanegroup.org slash webinars. That is a good URL to know because it is where all of our upcoming and archived webinars are posted. So with that, I am happy to pass it over right now to my colleague, Anna Adamson. Anna is a project manager here at Clean Energy Group, and she and Abby Ramanan, project director at Clean Energy Group, will be moderating today. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sam. So like Sam said, today's webinar is a presentation of the nonprofit Clean Energy Group. And our mission is to make sure that clean energy is available and accessible to everyone and that clean energy is affordable and reliable. To work towards those ends, we have four main focus areas, which you can see on the screen here, and you can explore more about them in our work on our website. Um, to work towards those four focus areas, we approach things from three main um, viewpoints or lenses, a technical, economic, and policy viewpoint um, with the goal of enabling communities to participate equitably in the clean energy transition. Today's webinar is focusing specifically on the Resilient Power Project and even more specifically on our two grant funding programs, the Technical Assistance Fund and the Resilient Power Leadership Initiative, which we'll dig into and define in just a minute. But first, I want to introduce our amazing panel of speakers. We've brought in several of our partners on our funding programs to speak today, including Denise Williams, who is Executive Director of Feed the Second Line. Denise um, and, and uh, Feed the Second Line received a Resilient Power Leadership Initiative Award in 2022. Amit Munchi, President and CEO of JPHB, and Anthony Nicholson, Lead Scientist at JPHB and Postdoctoral Fellow through a National Science Foundation Award, will also be presenting. JPHB is an engineering partner of the Technical Assistance Fund. Craig Lewis, Executive Director and Founder of Clean Coalition, will be speaking. Clean Coalition 2 is an engineering partner of the Technical Assistance Fund. We have a handout available that includes their full bios, and I definitely encourage everyone to check that out to learn about their experiences and knowledge and wisdom over the years, and really all that they, all that they bring to the table for these communities and for building resilient power that's available in the control panel under handouts, and we'll also include it in a follow-up email. Um, now, Abby and I will dig into a bit more of the Technical Assistance Fund and Resilient Power Leadership Initiative, what it is, and specifically our 2022 impacts and trends that we found. I'll pass it over to my colleague, Abby. Thank you so much, Anna, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, so today's webinar was prompted by, um, yeah, um, by the uh, publication of our first annual impact report. Um, so this report encapsulates um, all of our small grant funding program activities for 2022 um, and kind of goes into both um, what those programs are and also um, the uh, awardees that we were able to support throughout the year, um, as well as completed projects um, from 2022 and, and kind of some of the trends and, and um, resilient power uh, themes that emerged throughout that year. So we're so excited to um, have this first report out and we're planning on releasing these annual impact reports every year. Um, so thank you all for joining us for the launch of our first one. Next slide, please. Great. 
All right. <laughs> um, so first to do some table setting. Um, so we'll be referring to CEGs, um, what we call our small grant programs or um, small funding programs um, throughout this webinar. Um, and those encapsulate, encapsulate two um, small grant programs. The first is our technical assistance fund. Um, so the TAF, as we like to call it, um, was created almost 10 years ago, and um, it kind of emerged out of a need we were seeing in the communities we serve for um, kind of small grants during the pre-development phase of what we call resilient power projects, so typically solar and battery storage projects. Um, you know, underserved communities, marginalized communities, communities of color, low-income communities are often the ones that are most likely to lose power during severe weather events or other outages, and they're the ones that are most likely to need access to clean, resilient technology during those times. And we wanted to make sure that we were addressing um, that first initial critical resource gaps where folks were not getting the assistance they needed to um, even conceive of what um, their facilities needs are um, and uh, you know what kind of system they might need and what fundraising they might need to do to um, be able to pay for that system. So the TAF um, seeks to serve about, um, at least 50% of our funding is reserved for um, Black, Indigenous, People of Color communities and Black, Indigenous, People of Color led organizations. And that is, again, part of our commitment to really reaching the communities that are um, the least served by the clean energy transition right now. Um, and we do try to keep it at a very low barrier to entry. So, um, you know, that pre-development funding is for folks who are starting right at the beginning of their resilient power journey. So we're not asking for folks to have any prior knowledge of solar and storage or clean energy technologies when they apply for this funding um, or begin the technical assistance process. Um, as you can see from this graph, um, this looks at, um, this is an initial so what we do with folks who apply, um, how much existing knowledge they have of solar and storage technologies. And most folks are coming in with um, not a lot of knowledge. And that's kind of um, part of the, the design of the program is not requiring a ton of previous knowledge of solar and storage um, to apply. Next slide. And then our second um, small grant program is the Resilient Power Leadership Initiative or RIPLEY. Um, and this program is designed to be um, kind of in a, in a little different um, avenue than the, the TAF because it's more focused on organizations that are interested in solar and storage or resilient power, but also want to go beyond just uh, having, you know, maybe solar and storage at a particular community facility, but to uh, build programs um, that can expand um, access to solar and storage in their community or uh, knowledge of solar and storage or um, workforce development or other activities within the community that are connected to solar and storage. And um, what this grant does is it gives um, those organizations some of the capacity building space to develop a program that might um, serve the needs of their community in a slightly different way than uh, just having a solar and storage system on a particular facility. And this, again, we have a priority of focusing on BIPOC-led organizations. And since 2020, we have 100% um, of Ripley funds have gone towards BIPOC-led organizations. And the picture here is of uh, Queen Shabazz and the United Parents Against Lead uh, community that received a Ripley in 2022. Um, and this is them in front of a community resilience hub that they helped to uh, launch in their community with the help of a Ripley award. So these are our two kind of funding programs and they're gonna kind of cover the breadth of what we're talking about today. And I think you might be muted. Thank you so much. Always forget once in a while. Uh, digging into some key metrics, the Resilient Power Project, which includes our two funding programs over the last nine years, have been able to award 1.3 million to over 100 community service partners. And that uh, means that within the Technical Assistance Fund, 255 community facilities have been able to access a, a, a feasibility assessment through the Technical Assistance Fund. In the last year, in 2022 alone, we awarded $200,000 to 23 communities across 11 states and Native nations. 
um, in 2022. Uh, so the technical assistance fund, it works mostly on the pre-development feasibility assessment side of things, but we are here as a continued resource for projects as they work towards project development. And we were excited that six um, of our former TAF awardees were able to install solar um, or solar plus storage in 2022. That includes two community res resilience hubs in the state, a whole resilience hub network on the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico, as well as three affordable housing providers that were able to install solar and a couple of them are still exploring storage, but installed solar first. Uh, the photo is actually not from the Technical Assistance Fund, it's from uh, Feed the Second Line's Get Lit, Stay Lit program, which you'll learn about a little bit later in today's presentation from Denise. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, one thing that we wanted to explore in our report is um, kind of emerging themes and patterns that we were seeing with solar and storage because through the TAF and Ripley, we um, have a really great view of um, just what folks are working on in terms of kind of small scale solar and storage projects throughout the country and particularly how they're using these technologies um, to meet their community's different needs, which obviously vary depending on kind of the environment, um, both in terms of severe weather events or um, what kinds of outages they're experiencing, as well as economics. Um, so one of the biggest trends we saw was mobile solar and storage. Um, so mobile solar and storage refers to solar and, solar and storage systems that are typically um, installed on some sort of trailer, um, which allows the system, as the name implies, to be mobile and kind of move from place to place. So um, some examples of that were the Gentilly Beehive microgrid project in New Orleans. Um, and this was a microgrid that charges mobile battery units um, that can then be dispatched during outages to areas that might need power and don't have it. So the batteries can stay on site um, during kind of blue sky conditions and be charged by solar on site um, and then can be dispatched as needed. Um, a kind of completely different take on mobile solar and storage um, is a project through uh, Dignity Moves, which is a, a, a service provider for um, unhoused folks in California. Um, they worked with uh, the folks at Clean Coalition, who we'll hear from later on in this webinar, um, on designing solar and storage systems that work for um, temporary housing structures. So that solar and storage can move um, every three to five years because part of Dignity Moves um, mission and ethos is that they go to where folks need them rather than making um, unhoused folks come to them. So it's able to move to wherever they're needed. Next slide. Uh, another big trend we saw in solar and storage in 2022 is um, the use of resilient power for public health reasons. Um, so this picture that you see on the slide is actually, again, from um, some of our partners who we'll hear from later on, uh, JPHB. Um, so this typically refers to solar and storage that is used to power either um, emergency responders, first responders, uh, as well as for meeting the needs of medically vulnerable folks who might have um, uh, electronic devices that they need for uh, medical needs, such as a CPAP machine or um, if they need refrigeration for their insulin, things like that. Um, and so uh, we've looked at how resilient power can help serve those communities. And one of those projects was looking at um, some houses on in Navajo Nation, um, where there's many folks living off grid, um, including two uh, single family homes that had medically vulnerable individuals. Uh, and so the TF was help, able to support an assessment um, for those sites to look at how the, those homes could get solar and storage to power um, some medical devices. Next slide. Um, and then finally, we also really did want to highlight uh, in our report um, our partnerships. Uh, so our TAF engineers, as you might have guessed, since we have two of them on this webinar, are a huge part of um, why the TAF is successful. Um, while CEG is a resource throughout the assessment process and beyond as these uh, groups go on to develop solar and storage, we do not conduct the actual techno-economic feasibility assessments ourselves. We um, part of the funding that we provide to the TAF goes toward an engineering partner who is able to provide that techno-economic assessment um, and pricing analysis. And so, um, you know, we're so lucky to partner with many of the engineers who are you can see on the screen, um, including some of the folks who are on this call today. Um, and in addition to that, um, you know, I've mentioned a few times the CG is very committed to um, providing at least 50% of our awards. 
to BIPOC-led organizations. Um, since we've set that goal, we have yet to meet it, although 2022 was um, saw us reach the highest percentage of that yet, we uh, were able to award 43% of funds to BIPOC-led organizations in 2022. Um, but one uh, avenue for us to increase the amount of awards we're able to give to BIPOC-led organizations is through building out our network and being able to reach those organizations who might not have heard about this program otherwise and one of the best ways to do that um, is through our engineers who work with communities that we might not um, otherwise be engaged with and who can help refer us to folks. So um, really excited about that. And um, we did want to highlight two of our new partners in 2022. Um, in addition to Clean Coalition, who I've mentioned and who will hear from later on, um, we also partnered with uh, Gemini Energy Solutions, uh, who was a, a new partner and has brought us several projects as well. Uh, and then finally, one other kind of new partnership uh, that we had in 2022 was with the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, so CEG is a technical partner um, as part of Connecticut Green, Bank, Connecticut Green Bank's Energy Storage Solutions Program, um, where we specifically work with affordable housing providers in the state to um, get solar and storage assessments done um, so that they can take advantage of some of the awesome incentives that are available um, in Connecticut. Uh, and so this is kind of a continuation of um, work that CG has been doing since the inception of the Technical Assistance Fund. Um, affordable housing has typically been at least 50% of um, the awards that we give out. And part of that has been because um, there is obviously a huge need among affordable housing communities and um, a lot of folks who can benefit from resilient power. Um, but also it's just been kind of who we've uh, already known and those existing partnerships have, have kind of helped us to make those uh make those awards um so the the work with connecticut green bank is building on that a little bit because we've also were awarded a grant from the robert wood johnson foundation to look at specifically how again um, solar and storage can support uh, the health needs of folks in affordable housing um, so a lot of the assessments that we're doing now through this program um, are focused on affordable housing for seniors or folks living with disabilities and how um, the provider can either create a community space um, that has power during outages or provide um, access to outlets during outages so that folks can charge medical devices or um, other kind of smaller devices such as cell phones. I think that's all from me. Awesome. So when communities are first interested in solar plus storage and interested in participating in the technical assistance fund, we ask them to fill out a short intake survey. And within that intake uh, survey, we ask them to fill out some basic information about their projects. And we also have a question that asks them to rank their primary motivations for pursuing um, solar plus storage. And you can see the four options that we give them listed on the screen here, resilient backup power, electricity bill savings, renewable electricity, and community ownership. We do find that a lot of our projects, um, their motivation for pursuing solar plus storage includes all of these, but it's important for us um, to be able to see which one is most important so that we make sure that that is prioritized when they are developing their feasibility assessment report. It's also interesting to look at this data in the aggregate. As you can see on the left-hand side of the chart, resilient backup power was a primary motivation for almost half of all TAF applicants in 2022 and only two, per, two, two projects that applied to the TIF in 2022 listed it, listed it as their least important factor. Electricity bill savings were listed, um, were not listed as often as the primary motivation, but ultimately it is a very important factor as folks are deciding um, whether and how projects can continue and if they are financially feasible to pursue and install solar plus storage. Um, on the far right hand side, you'll see community ownership, um, both community ownership and renewable electricity um, were listed as first um, as the primary motivation uh, four times and for community ownership, all four of those were from community based organizations. So as I had said earlier, uh, the Technical Assistance Fund works with projects through the, the feasibility assessment process. And at the end of that, when projects have the feasibility assessment in hand, we ask them to fill out an exit survey. And within that survey, um, we have a question about what barriers those projects anticipate they will 
experience as they go through project development. So we give them this uh, long number of, of options to choose from, and they're supposed to pick their top three and then rank those. You can see that regulatory uncertainty and fire safety were lower on the list or chosen less um, compared to the other options, almost all of the um, projects that have gone through the technical assistance fund uh, mentioned either project not being economically feasible or the lack of financing options as um, an important barrier that they anticipate they'll experience um, going into project development. Um, it's important to note that projects as they're moving forward, they're often looking for financing or looking for grant support or, or need to find ways to raise capital to develop projects. Um, once they do have that in hand, then they um, often experience additional barriers, especially projects um, through COVID-19 and through supply chain issues. Uh, they had secured financing, but then experienced some additional barriers that push projects back months, sometimes years. Um, are on, on average, about 20 to 25% of TIF um, awards move forward and actually get installed. That doesn't mean that the other 70, 75% of projects will never get installed. It only means that they're in various stages of project development and have hit um, delays that have not led them to be able to get installed just yet, but they're still working through it and we're still here as a resource for them. Um, it is, there is some good news on the horizon. The economic feasibility of projects, um, it's looking a bit better uh, since the Inflation Reduction Act was passed in 2022 and since the investment tax credit was improved and expanded. Now, um, previously, the investment tax credit was only an opportunity for folks who had tax liability or um, tax exempt organizations formerly had to work with someone who had tax liability through a lease or PPA structure but now tax exempt organizations can receive direct pay reimbursement of the investment tax credit. So that means that um, nonprofits, municipalities, rural electric co-ops and tribal nations are all um, eligible to receive this, this um, enormous benefit back, which is a huge game changer and very important to um, the projects that we're working with. Uh, the ITC was expanded. So now projects can receive back at least 30% of eligible project costs for their solar plus storage project and by pairing um, the base credit with any number of bonus credits they can potentially receive up to 70 percent back um, of their eligible project costs i did a bit of math so over the last nine years of all taf awardees that we've ever um ever ever awarded um over 60 percent could be eligible for either the energy community bonus credit and or the low end community bonus credit so that means over 60% of TAF awardees uh, could be eligible for at least 40% um, or more in some cases, which is really, really great news um, and will hopefully help a lot more project, projects get over the, the finish line and get projects installed. In uh, 2022, um, looking at the numbers that folks had self-reported in the intake survey, if all of the TAF awardees that were awarded in 2022 are actually able to get installed and have solar plus storage systems at their facilities. Those systems have the potential to serve over 20,000 community members and 3,000 affordable housing residents. So we'll certainly be working with them and hope to have a lot of those um, continue through project development and get installed so that we can really have this tremendous community impact. Um, in 2023, we have seen um, increased interest in the technical assistance fund. More folks are applying and more folks from across the country. Um, there's a bit of a preview to next year's report in that we've been able to support projects in four new states, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and Utah. You can see they're colored in blue there. And I am digging into some of the other um, information that we've received from our intake and exit surveys and, and other data points from this year and starting to work on our 2023 year in review report. So just want to flag that anyone who's um, interested in learning about 2023's um, stats, once that comes out, hopefully early next year, um, make sure that you are subscribed to our newsletter so that you get your first to know um, and also get to learn about all of our amazing 2023 awardees as well. So with that, I just want to thank you all for listening to Abby and I, and I think we've taken enough, up enough of your time. I want to pass over the mic to the real stars of the show, the folks that um, are really doing the amazing community work on the ground. Uh, first up, we have Denise Williams from Feed the Second Line. So I'll pass over the mic to Denise. 
Great. Thank you all for having me here. I'm very excited to be on this call and just let everybody know what we're doing here at Feed the Second Line with our initiative, Get Lit, Stay Lit. So what we're doing is actually empowering local restaurants to turn into hurricane resilience hubs by using solar and batteries. Next slide, please. So Feed the Second Line, our organization is fairly new. Um, we started in 2020 and our mission is building a stronger safety net, having job, creating job, create job opportunities and the healthy culture for the culture creators of New Orleans. And those culture creators are the masking Indians, the baby dolls, the musicians, the second liners, which are the folks that help make our city vibrant. Next slide. In August 2021, we launched Get Lit, Stay Lit. Next slide. So we all know um, Hurricane Ida was very powerful and it was just an eye opener of how our city is very vulnerable when it comes to natural disasters. The governor even called Hurricane Ida the strongest storm to hit Louisiana since 1856. Next slide. Um, the electrical grid was completely knocked out. Um, many neighborhoods were without power for 10 days. A lot of people lost their lives. And what we realized during those few days, we hope that it will never ever be 10 again, but during those few days after a hurricane, we wanna make sure that we're able to address the basic needs of the community. And that's how Get Lit, Stay Lit was birthed. So we realized there are community members that simply won't evacuate. Either they can't afford it, um, their elders, health issues. So we wanted to collectively come together and create an effort that we're all working together because when it comes down to a hurricane and the aftermath, in most cases, all we have is each other. Next slide, please. So I had this beautiful video to show, but we can't show it. So I'll just dive in and you all will get a chance to see it later. Um, so as I say, we're empowering neighborhood restaurants. I don't know what's going on with my slides here, but the problem we realized is after the storm, the power is out. Um, our neighborhood community members, they're just left here to fend for themselves. And we know that elders died simply from heat exhaustion and people were hungry. So what are the needs? The top needs, we just need to make sure that they have a place to cool off. Um, there's somewhere for them to eat. They can charge their cell phone devices and just, just have a drink of ice cold water. But we realized we need to do, do it even better. We need to make sure that it's in their neighborhoods where they have access to it. So with Get Lit, Stay Lit, we want to create this block by block radius in communities where we know that our residents are not going to evacuate, where they're able to walk to get these basic needs addressed. Um, so yes, we have decided that we're going to put solar panels and battery backups on these restaurants and make them become hubs in the neighborhood. Next slide. So there's um so there's just such a great impact behind this initiative. Well, I'll start with the restaurant owners. Number one, we're empowering them to be pretty much a first responder in their neighborhood. The best thing about having the solar panels and battery backup is that they're able to save money on their energy bills. They're able to save money on their energy bills. They're also able to actually save their food because we know in the event of a power outage, when you think of a restaurant, once the power is out for X amount of time, they have to throw all that food away. That's their investment. That's how they make money. So if we can save that we're actually saving them thousands of dollars. They can come back to work quickly if that area is deemed safe. And then like we say, we're actually creating a space for the actual community members to be able to come in. And this space now goes from a restaurant to actually being a safe haven. So when the grid is out, that restaurant is staying lit. Next slide, please.
Next slide. All right, there we go. All right. So in height of all this, we thought it would be a great idea to actually partner with our local cultural groups to create a job training, job pipeline, training pipeline for our city. So you know what that means, more jobs for the culture. Next slide. So in doing this, we're partnering with LA Green Corps and Solar Alternatives. So Solar Alternatives is actually who we use to actually do our installations. And LA Green Corps, we're able to actually recruit culture bears from different groups. They can actually go to through LA Green Corps and there they're introduced to not only solar, but other green jobs get that training, and if they decide to choose that route to actually install solar panels, then they actually get hired through, L through Solar Alternatives. So they can go from a job of making eight to $10 an hour to actually starting off between 18 to $20 an hour. Next slide. So we know every neighborhood needs a microgrid for the next hurricane. What if neighborhood restaurants were the solution? Next slide. So we have a total of four staylets. Um, we have five more pending, but this is our first staylet, which is Queen Trini Lisa. She's located in Mid City, and we, she was so excited to be the first staylet um, and just being able to give back to the community. Next slide. This is, I don't know why it's out of order, but this is actually our third stay lit for Ty, which is in Treme. Next slide. Totally out of order. This is our fourth stay lit, Grace at the Green Light, which is actually different. So typically we would do an install on a restaurant, but Grace at the Green Light is also a soup kitchen that actually takes care of our unhoused residents in New Orleans. And so at the Hurricane Ida throughout the 10 days with no power, they were actually open and being a safe haven for those unhoused residents. So it was very imperative to make uh, Grace at the Green Light a stay lit. Next slide. And this is our second uh, stay lit, which is Aphrodisiac Nola that is located in Gentilly. Next slide. And I just want to talk about the Resilient Power Community Leadership Initiative and how it has helped me. Um, with these funds, I was able to do more restaurant recruitment, build the experience with culture bears, um, we were able to partner with Glass Half Full. We were able to take a trip into the Bayou, um, Bayou B of New. And what Glass Half Full does is they actually take glass, they recycle it and turn it into sand. And what they're trying to do is build that barrier along the coast to actually help with the flooding that comes into our city. The special part about it was we were located um, near the Ninth Ward, trying to just create a barrier there. And it was just a overwhelming experience because I actually had a big chief from the Ninth Ward, big chief Dewey Robert from the Ninth Ward Black Hatchet. And um, it was just a powerful experience just to see him there put in the sandbags and just saying like hey i wish that there was other organizations and ways that we could partner because it seems like we can help being a first responder and he was just very empowered to be able to do that also with the funding i was able to hire a grant writing team to actually help with a specific grant that i was applying for and as of 2023, our Get List Stay Lit initiative was actually one of the winners of the Inclusive Energy Innovation Live Pitch Prize, where we were awarded $250,000, and that is going to allow us to have more Stay Lit. Next slide. Uh, 
Um, we know that there is no way to get around power outages or escaping the impacts of mother nature. And though we can't control it, we just want to be prepared. And that's what Get Lit Stay Lit is. We're trying to be prepared and making sure that we're able to be on the front lines for our community members. Our goal is to have a citywide network of 300 Stay Lit. And we're almost there. Um, and we're just going to keep working hard. And if you guys want to learn more about Feed the Second Line, you can go to feedthesecondline.org. If you would like to be a part of what we were doing, what, are, what we're doing, we would greatly appreciate it. It's going to take all of us together um, to make sure that we're stepping up and standing tall for our city. So thank you. And thank you for having me. Next slide. I think that's the end of the slides. All right. Okay. Hopefully I can advance the slides. Let's go ahead and see. All right. So uh, thank you all for having me, everyone. My name is Anthony Pino Nicholson. I'll be presenting on behalf of JPHB to discuss our efforts in trying to assist Navajo families to achieve energy resiliency. Uh, next slide. So our core team um, here at JPHB consists of a diverse group of technical experts who all want the goal to be um, advancing thin film photovoltaics to achieve higher efficiencies, better reliability, and accessibility to commercialized solar within the US supply chain. Um, JPHB is committed to uh, being able to provide opportunities to support underserved communities, uh, which would include indigenous populations uh, throughout the Navajo Nation, especially off-grid rural families, which we'll be talking about today. Um, so we'll go ahead and be discussing more about our energy assessments that we've done for these uh, Navajo families with support from Clean Energy Group. And then we'll discuss a little bit more about the uh, energy resiliency solutions that we'll be providing to these families as well. Next slide. So before we get into that, um, I wanna discuss some of the advantages of PV plus uh, storage systems. We know that solar energy can provide uh, electricity to both res residential communities as well as the industrial sector. But uh, when you have solar energy combined with energy storage, there's many more opportunities to benefit for uh, accessibility to other resources such as uh, clean water and food, food production. Uh, there's also uh, another sector that's been uh, coming online recently, which is uh, agrivoltaics. And that involves being able to grow crops much better under the solar panels because of the shading conditions. So we see that there's a lot of benefits that can be had um, using solar plus uh, some type of energy storage. And we see that these benefits can be extended to off-grid families that live in rural areas, especially for Navajo families. And so that's why we think that there would be a tremendous benefit on a more localized community scale if we were to implement these PV plus storage systems for these uh, Navajo families. Uh, next slide. Um, so some of the potential impacts by off-grid PV plus storage are as shown here. Um, if you could go ahead and advance the slide a couple times, uh, have a couple animations shown here. But um, our first one is going to be being able to achieve a self-sustainable energy solution by making a PV plus storage system that is uh, standalone or could be combined with the current um, energy system that these families have, which as you see at the top are going to be diesel generators, which is what these families often use. We could also use PV plus storage systems again to have access to some of these more essential resources such as clean water and um, food produce. But something equally important is uh, medical supplies. Many of these families live far away from uh, urban areas or medical facilities, and thus it becomes very important to 
provide a uh, sustainable energy solution that will be able to keep their uh, medical supplies um, in good condition so that they can use that for times when they're not able to, uh, um, to reach these medical facilities. And lastly, uh, PV plus storage systems that are off-grid also enable workforce development and educational opportunities, such as the ones uh, that we see on the bottom left, and being able to help the local community either through training opportunities on how to maintain these PV storage systems or um, even go further by providing them with employment opportunities that then they could take advantage of and being able to set up these systems for their neighbors within their local community. Next slide. So uh, we were able to do a couple of these energy assessments for uh, these Navajo families in areas uh, within Arizona. Two different chapters are what we focused on, Navajo Mountain chapter and the Chichimbito chapter. And we were looking at the feasibility for uh, providing off-grid PV plus storage solutions for these families. Uh, on the right, we have an example of one of these homesteads that we were looking at and really understanding what the consumer energy needs are for these families and being able to design a solution that would then uh, be suitable for that family. But um, the one thing I do wanna point out, if you could advance the slide one more, um, or I should say just that point, the objective, is we want to identify the needs of these family homesteads first prior to providing a solution. We, we don't want to go into uh, these families and their homesteads thinking that we have a solution, but rather really identifying what those needs are and then understanding that energy resiliency may mean something different for each family. So that's why these energy assessments were so important for us to, to really carry out for each family. Next slide. And more important than the technical aspects are really being able to meet with these families face to face and understand their personal problems. Um, we were able to meet with one family who were significantly impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, not only through economic hardships, but also the loss of loved ones. And so it becomes really important for us to use these energy assessments to really design an off-grid PV plus storage system that will not only alleviate the problems that they have in the short term, but also be something that will be sustainable for them in the long term. Um, we've already talked about being able to provide opportunities for uh, further agricultural produce, but you can see on the right side, um, they did have a, an off-grid PV plus storage system designed um, in the early 2000s, but this particular system failed only a couple months later. So all of these years, they haven't been able to, to harness this energy and use it for their benefit. So that's why we wanna design a solution that is that requires minimal maintenance, and then also uh, be able to maintain that over uh, many, many years so that these families can benefit from it. Another important thing is to make sure that the um, homestead is, uh, or the cultural uh, livelihood is preserved by integrating this system with the homestead, as well as the livestock that these families uh, depend on in their day-to-day uh, -day living. Next slide. So uh, in combination with the uh, energy assessments that we've been doing, as well as the designing for energy solutions for those families, we've also reached out to several uh, companies to see if there's ways that they would be um, able to donate supplies to us so then we could expand the homestead locations where we're able to um, implement the, the current design. And so a couple companies that I want to highlight are uh, First Solar, which is a US-based CADTEL thin film uh, solar energy manufacturing company. And we received um, approval for them to donate more than 20 modules that we'll be using to set up for um, several of these families. We've also received 15 modules that were gifted by Grid Alternatives, which is the largest nonprofit solar installer um, in the US. We've also been partnering with Omco Solar to receive uh, discounts or donated supplies for racking and mounting structures that we'll be installing the uh, solar panels on. So these companies are um, ones that are also seeing the benefit of our initiative and being able to 
support these underserved communities as well. Next slide. So we've been uh, trying to really design an off-grid PV plus storage system that will be um, beneficial for all families. But we first wanted to start with a prototype design so that we could have more of a standardized solution that's based off of each of the uh, energy needs of those families. So um, at our testing site at the solar research field at Colorado State University, um, you can see myself and my colleague, Dr. Munchi in the top uh, photos, we're setting up uh, four 400 watt solar panels to test this solar array configuration with our prototype design. And um, you can kind of see that in the next slide, if you could please advance it there. We have uh, our prototype design shown here with the uh, solar array configuration hooked up to it. And we're just trying to make sure that the overall efficiency of the system is working the way that it's intended. We have the various components that convert the solar energy into usable electricity, as well as battery storage units that would allow us to um, harness the, the energy to be used at a later time. And so far, um, we've seen that the response of this system is working as expected. And we also noticed that um, we're able to uh, data log a lot of this information in real time. So it, it gives us a good perspective on how to improve over uh, several months with all the data that we're able to accumulate later on. Next slide. And so uh, we've come up with a final design for our off-grid PV plus storage system, which will consist of an electrical enclosure, which is shown here, and that will house all of these electrical components that we're um, using for this PV plus storage system. And we've decided to modify the battery bank to be a little bit larger to accommodate for uh, multiple days of autonomy for these families in case the weather isn't behaving the way that you would expect. So we're really excited to be able to roll out um, this final design for this off-grid PV plus storage system um, in the coming months and we're looking to install this for at least one family um, in the next several months. Next slide. So I'd like to thank you all for listening and if you have any questions that we're not able to answer at the end of this webinar please feel free to email us at these uh, two email addresses. And if you're interested in learning more about JPHB, you can find more information at this website at jphb.us. Um, I also just wanna quickly acknowledge um, several others who have been such a tremendous help to us. That includes uh, Jeff B. Gay, Darlene Pino, and uh, Eugene Bodoni for acting as liaisons during our energy assessments for the two chapters that we visited in Arizona. We also want to thank uh, Clean Energy Group for their support, as well as the National Science Foundation and the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund for their funding for our um, outreach initiatives. Well, thank you uh, for your time. Awesome, thank you, Anthony. And also thank you to Denise for her earlier presentation. Uh, before I hand it over to Craig, I just want to rem remind folks that if you've thought of any questions or think of any while Craig's presenting, please go ahead and add those into the uh, question and answer box, please. All yours, Craig. Super, thank you. And uh, it's a real honor to, to, to be here and be part of the cohort that, that uh, Clean Energy Group has supported. Um, the Clean Coalition is a very technical nonprofit, and we have a specialty in solar microgrids and community microgrids, or more broadly, solar-driven microgrids is, is really a specialty for the Clean Coalition. And we work with a lot of cities, counties, school districts, and nonprofit entities. And I'm very grateful for Clean Energy Group's support to allow us to support uh, to facilitate solar microgrids for a number of nonprofit entities, including an organization that was mentioned earlier, Dignity Moves, which is a transitional housing uh, nonprofit. They provide transitional housing to take people from a homeless um, circumstances to a house, housed circumstances. And in the transition period uh, where they are um, uh, being supported by Dignity Moves, they are in a um, housing facility that, that provides a lot of services as well to uh, take care of health and 
uh, employment type of services as well as as helping to get them into permanent housing and uh, there's a whole lot of services that are associated with that the clean coalition has worked with dignity moves at a number of sites and the site that i'm going to be talking about here today is uh, the santa maria site santa maria is in the central part of california uh, not far off the coast and the the reason i chose this site i didn't realize that um that anthony was going to be talking about off-grid uh, solutions so i i was going to talk about santa maria because i thought it was very interesting that um, it, it originally it was intended to start as a an off-grid solution because the utility in this region uh, in the region where santa that serves santa maria is pacific gas and electric or uh, what's known as pg e and pg e was saying that they were going to require about a year to bring electricity service to the site um, not because there wasn't electricity, you know, an electric grid uh, that passes right by here, but they were, pg e was saying that the, the grid is very constrained in this area and they were not going to be able to provide the extra, um, uh, you know, the service because that would strain their grid too much to add that, that extra load in this area. Um, so originally this was intended to be off-grid and then transition to on-grid once pg e was ready to connect this site to, to, the, uh, to the electricity grid. Uh, this is a view of the site plan and uh, basically it's comprised of a number of uh, modular units. And so this is, this is uh, a couple of example units that are uh, earmarked for the site. Um, the um the the clean coalition scope was was really to optimize the mix of distributed energy resources and i i apologize for not explaining my acronyms at first use uh, this is a, a a shortening of a much bigger presentation <laughs> and i forgot that uh I, I didn't pay attention that der stands for distributed energy resources which stands for local solar local energy storage and other um, other distributed energy resources that kind of enable those things to uh, the solar and the storage to work together things like load management and microgrid controllers that's all and electric vehicle charging infrastructure that's all part of the der mix or the distributed energy resources mix um, so the clean coalition's scope is to you know has been to serve uh, or, or, or to, to uh, determine how to serve all of the energy needs for a 100% elect electric community. So this is an all electric community, um, uh, 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 you know, until the uh, utility, which is pg e can provide service. The, um, in addition, we wanted to achieve uh, net zero energy. Um, and then even once pg e can provide service to the site, um, every solar microgrid that the Clean Coalition designs is always designed to make sure that the most critical loads, what we refer to as the tier one loads, will be supported 100% of the time. So if the grid, even if the grid goes down for a month or a year or for the rest of time, the critical loads will be supported. Um, and then the, the rest of the loads, including the tier two loads, which are the priority loads, and the tier three loads, which are discretionary, they're, they're not very important, but you know, if, if all else being equal, you'll keep them on. Um, uh, we want to make sure that, that all of the loads can be supported for significant percentages of time. And, and with respect to the, the, the priority loads, the tier two loads, we will uh, design those to stay on for the vast majority of time as well. Um, we, we aimed to preempt the use of any diesel or other fossil fuels on the site. And um, a key part of this particular site plan uh, or this, the, 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 the solar microgrid efforts for Dignity Move Santa Maria, which is the second Dignity Move site that the Clean Coalition supported, um, was to make sure that we come out of this with a standardized approach so that all of the future sites that Dignity Moves establishes can basically just borrow the same uh, very uh, standardized approach and, and a very modular kitted approach. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then, and then at the same time, we want to maximize the economic benefits for, for, the, for the sites. The, the, the Clean Coalition has a solar microgrid methodology that is comprised of five steps. Um, 
Anthony kind of hinted at the first step, which is you know making sure that you know how much load you're having to deal with. So we we call that the load profile step. Then we go into the resource scenario step, and that's you know, how much solar and storage are we going to need to provide for the load scenario that we are uh, you know that we've 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 you know determined. And the load scenario is not only what's the total load. Uh, but what is the critical load? And that critical load can never turn off. So that's the critical load is super important in our in our uh, solar microgrid methodology. And then we do site layouts, we do the economic analyses, and and then report the results. And um, so I'm just going to kind of step through very quickly. And by the way, these slides are you know I, I've uh, uh, Clean Energy Group is going to share these with everybody. And um, uh, so you can go back and look at all the details you might want to, but given the time constraints, I'm going to be going through these slides very quickly. This slide basically shows the typical um, uh, uh, levels of, of resilience that are derived from clean coalition design solar microgrids. And this particular site is from a uh, solar slash community microgrid that the clean coalition designed for University of California at Santa Barbara. And uh, it's on the coast, it, it's, it's right on the ocean. So there's actually a lot of fog and the solar resource at this particular location is not that great. But if you have enough solar to net zero the site, and then you have for every kilowatt of solar, you have two kilowatt hours of energy storage. This is the result you get. You get 100% um, of the time, we'll keep the tier one loads on. So the tier one load is the is the bottom uh, layer there. And the way to read this chart is the vertical axis is the, is the percentage of load and the horizontal axis is the percentage of time. So the critical loads are usually only about 10% of the loads and we keep those on for 100% of the time. So that's that bottom layer on this chart. The next layer up is the is the priority uh, tiers, the tier two, which are priority loads. You'll keep them on as long as you can, without the ability, to, uh, without um, threatening the to to keep the ability to keep your tier ones on. So tier two loads will be kept on for at least 80% of the time, and then the the, the rest of the loads, the the remaining 75% of the loads are discretionary, and even those will be kept on for at least 25% of the time. Um, I always like to compare this to the resilience you get from a diesel generator. A diesel generator only on a typical diesel generator um, microgrid only has two days of on-site fuel supply. So after two days, the diesel generator turns off and your lights out for everything. Your tier ones, your tier twos, and your tier threes, everything's gone. Uh, and so that's represented by this little red hashed uh, rectangle down here in the bottom left corner. Um, that that just gives you the relative uh, resilience between a solar microgrid with a vast amount of resilience versus the diesel generator driven resilience, which is that little little uh, red hashed rectangle. Um, the load tiering requires you to really be cognizant of what all your loads are. So this is basically a, a, a breakdown of all of the electrical panels across the site, which all start at the main service. You get the main service comes in goes out to some distribution panels, goes down to some um, some actual circuit breaker panels, and and ultimately gets down to the to the actual loads that you're you're serving, which are the appliances and whatnot. So over on the far right are three columns, and those those colored columns are tier one, tier two, and tier three loads. So we category tier every all of the loads, and then we make sure that those tier one loads we we figure out how much how much um, power and energy capacity is required to make sure that those will always stay on and uh, we that's very fundamental to the way we design our solar microgrids in terms of the resource layouts for the santa maria site um, uh, i will and, and, and basically this slide base just shows um, this is the result for the santa maria site in terms of our our our, our, our load tiering and 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 kind of the amount of solar and storage that we had had earmarked for the site. And I'm sorry, this slide seems to be a little bit out of sequence, but uh, it's an important slide. And and that 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 colorful chart there, the yellow basically shows the amount of solar that is going directly to load. And this is this is this is these are bar charts for 365 days out of the year. So it starts on January, ends in December. And um, what you can see here is that the yellow is solar that goes directly to load. So that's real time solar is hitting those loads, serving those loads. Blue is solar that gets time shifted through the battery and then serves load. 
And then the brown is basically the amount of energy that you're either going to get from the grid if you're grid connected, or it's the amount of energy you're gonna get from a diesel generator if you happen to have a diesel generator in the design, or it's the amount of load shedding you're going to have to do. So that's basically a bunch of tier three loads getting shed. Most, you know, whenever it's a lot of brown, you're gonna be turning off those tier three loads. And then when there's a lot of sun the next day, right, you can turn them back on. Um, but basically the, the brown is, is a deficiency that the solar cannot provide by itself, either in real time or time shifted through the battery. And what you can see here is that for the central part of the year, we can, we can, we can handle almost, you know, almost the entire central part of the year, we can handle 100% of the load. And so, uh, in, and this is an all electric site, as I mentioned. So that, that basically tells us that um, we were planning to have the site come on online without any pg e service. And it was supposed to come online in March. And, uh, in, 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 and so we knew we had six months of time before we had to worry about having a diesel generator uh, rolled in. Uh, 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 but it was designed to basically allow a diesel generator to roll in. Um, this is a, 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 the, the way that the solar is laid out across the site. It's basically on these modular housing units. Um, this is the, 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 the way that the batteries are basically designed in. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going very quickly. Uh, the, this is the actual modular units and how the solar is laid out on the rooftops of the units. And this is, this is designed to be very standardized. So in the future, in future Dignity Move sites, these will just be kitted. So if you're, you're, you're the modular unit on the left, which is called a cube 64, then you need two solar panels for it. And here's how they attach. And here's the, here's the mounting equipment that you need, right? And this all comes in a kit. It just rolls out right there, right after the, the, the modular housing unit arrives. And same thing on the right, that's, a, that's called a cube 144 and it's a bigger unit and it can handle four solar panels. So we completely standardized this and including how those um, from, from one housing unit to the next, how they're connected together in, in, in the interconnection process. And the, um, as I said, you might have to roll a diesel generator in. So this is, the, this is a mobile diesel generator that we specified that would be you know, appropriately sized for the site. And, um, you know, our, our goal was to not have the diesel generator needed ever, but, you know, uh, if it was needed, it would be easy to roll one in. Um, the economic analysis, this is, this is a breakdown of the upfront costs, um, both the, the capital expenditures, which are your, all your upfront costs, that's in the top table. And then the bottom table is your ongoing operations and maintenance costs. And both of those are really important when you do your economic analyses. Uh, Anthony was referring to, he wants to make things simple, you know, his group wants to make things simple for the, uh, for, for the folks that they're supporting when they deploy a solar microgrid, and they want, also want to make sure it lasts for a long time with minimal maintenance required. And, you know, that's, that's exactly how you want to design these systems, uh, but there still are costs to, to maintaining the systems over time. And you want to make sure those get accounted for. This is basically the uh, ultimate um, uh, results. The the bar on the left, uh, that is the uh, bill savings. If you were grid connected, this is how much you'd be saving um, from the um, from the electricity bill. And this is for a cash purchase approach, by the way. So this is assuming that Dignity Moves pot paid for the solar microgrid. Uh, you know, and, and having it deployed and, and operated over, over a, a, a 25 year period. Um, and then uh, the, 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 the bar on the right, um, that is the value resilience. That's how much you would have to be paying to get the same level of resilience from a diesel generator. And so together those things add up to some very significant savings. Um, typically, the Clean Coalition also does the analysis from the perspective of a power purchase agreement. So that's a, what PPA stands for, is power purchase agreement. That's where a third party comes in and builds, on an op builds owns and operates the, the solar microgrid elements. And, uh, and so the economics are different because the, nobody does anything for free in, the, in this business. So the, the solar microgrid provider that is owning and operating the, the system they are going to pay. You know, they're going to they're going to uh, have a price that you know, is charged for the electricity that is delivered. Um, and so the, these economics are a little bit different than they are under the cash purchase plan. But I wanted to make sure just to show show both. 
And um, we did look at a couple of additional resource scenarios. We, we looked at um, sizing the battery twice as big. Um, and, and basically, if, uh, if we do that, we have uh, situations where that pink line now, uh, that wasn't in the prior chart, that's the amount of solar that basically gets exported to the grid if you're grid connected, or it's the amount of solar that you have to curtail. So you have to keep your solar, your energy use and supply needs to always be in balance. So if you can't export that that solar, excess solar to the grid, then you have to you have to curtail it. Um, this is a look at if we only use uh, if we cut the battery size in half for economic optimization. You can see there's more brown that shows up in this in this picture, and so that means that we'd have more days where we'd have to curtail load uh, if we weren't grid connected. Um, and then this is if we um, uh, let's see. Um, not, I think this is where we we oh we increased we increased we added about 50% more solar in this case, and so you can see there's there's actually less um, less need and we we increased the battery sizes as well. So you can see there's less brown in this picture than the early, the early ones. And with that, I will hand it back to our um, community uh, our, our CEG folks. Awesome, thank you, Craig, and thank you to our other presenters. Um, now we can open it up to q and I invite our other panelists to turn on their cameras if they can, and we can uh, kick it off first with a question um, for Denise. Um, let me pull that one up. How are your restaurants compensated for participating as a resilience hub? And this is uh, for the Get Lit, Stay Lit program. Um, Denise, if you're able to answer that. Chase, you are muted. So if you're able to see the little red uh, microphone, Denise, on your webinar console and click on that, that should allow you to unmute. There we okay, go. Okay, there it is. I was having issues with the mouse. Um, what was the question? I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, how are the rep restaurants compensated for participating as a resilience hub? So the restaurants are not compensated, like we're not paying them to do it. So are they asking how are we funding or? Yes, let's take it that way then. And if oh, the person who asked the question wants to clarify, um, they can do so. So um, the restaurants are actually um, not paid to be a uh, save lit, but how we're able to actually get save lits is through um, our grassroots funding, um, organizations like CG. Um, also, we were able to get some funding from the city. We were awarded $300,000 of Wisner funds and again, um, funding from the DOE as well. And then like you had said in your presentation, I imagine there's other benefits like their refrigerators could be charged so then they're not losing that food supply. Um, well, could you also exactly so like those those are the benefits are of being a stay lit um so that's what we want like we realize after a hurricane once the power is out they're actually once the power is out they have to throw their food away so they're losing out on thousands of dollars like that is their investment so being able to be a stay lit so when other restaurants or the grid is down like they're able to be back in business if the area is deemed safe Thank you, Denise. Um, so our next question um, is, I think, going to be for Anthony. Um, and so, you know, Craig, you'd mentioned for the, the off-grid site that you all had worked on in Santa Maria, um, that, you know, you kind of had a critical load assessment for uh, the, the system of what would be supported by the battery. Um, but for Anthony, the, the projects you worked on that were also off-grid, um, were was the solar and storage system expected to cover the load of the entire household? or just uh, critical loads? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right now, we're just looking at the uh, critical loads. There are uh, some built-in um, design structures where we could supplement with the diesel generators to accommodate for if, if there's any weather changes that we could actually have the power uh, necessary to accommodate for those changes. But for now, we're just trying to design it in a way that would be 
uh, just one day of autonomy uh, for the critical things that they need, uh, whether that's for the medical supplies, uh, being able to store that inside of refrigerators and things like that. So um, there, there are some leeway things, but as Craig already mentioned, the cost of these things start to accumulate pretty quickly. So we're trying to keep it as simple as possible, but then also keep in mind the cost. Absolutely. And staying on the same track of cost, um, for both of our engineers here, what is the technology and upfront cost distinction between a solar and battery storage for backup power versus a solar microgrid? Maybe I'll leave or that. I guess define <laughs> if there is a difference between the two. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I can I can take that uh, at least a first stab at it. So, you know, typically the the solar microgrid, you're going to have a couple of additional expenses. You're going to have a load management solution that allows you to toggle um, the tier two loads and the tier three loads, or as Anthony just indicated, you, you, you put the system on a critical load panel. So there's a critical load panel that's required. So there's a, there's there's some load, and a critical load panel is basically just a very simple load management solution. Um, so you have load management elements, and then you have microgrid controller elements, and then you have a inverter that has to be capable of what's called uh, grid forming and black start. Um, grid forming means it can um, send a, 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 a sinusoidal wave signal just like the grid does so that the every every you know all of the loads think the grid is on. <laughs> it's basically that the, the microgrid is 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 acting like the grid, um, just like the broader grid. So it has to be able to do grid forming and then black start is if everything goes down, the, the microgrid has to be able to bring the loads back up. The, the whole system needs to come back up. And so that's that's what's referred to as black start. Um, so uh, the, the inverters that are capable of grid forming black start are a little bit more expensive. All in all, I'd say that the premium that would be required to go from just a simple solar and storage deployment that's gonna be turned off if the grid goes down compared to a solar microgrid that stays up, you know, is, is designed to stay up when the grid goes down. Uh, is about 10%. So you're going to add about 10% to the overall costs of the project. And and I should say that all of those costs that I mentioned are are covered by the Inflation Reduction Act. So you know if you have 30%, um, I think it was Abby that was presenting earlier. Abby or Anna presented a slide that showed you know kind of what the Inflation Reduction Act adds. It was either 30. It was somewhere between like 30%, 50% of the installed cost of the project is going to get covered by Uncle Sam if you're a tax exempt entity. And uh, and so, you know, that 10% really turns into a seven, you know, five to 7% adder. Anthony or Tanise, did you have anything to add? I know Tanise, you'd start to say something. No, I think you covered it pretty just, well. Um, yeah. Just the, the kind of, um, talk from my side. My side is mostly focused on off-grid uh, PV plus storage, so not dealing necessarily with any uh, microgrids or trying to, you know, match with the the overall grid structure because a lot of these families, again, they live miles and miles away from the nearest utility grid, so we're trying to really design uh, an independent solution that um, is uh, tailored for those families. Great. Well, um, this question, I think I, I'd like to throw to actually all our panelists because I'd be curious um, what your, your thoughts are, but um, what are some of the first steps you would recommend for state governments um, looking to get their own solar plus storage rebate program off the ground? Um, and I'll, I, I can start off um, and I'll just say that I know from our experience at Clean Energy Group, um, one thing we would recommend is really just assessing your existing landscape um, in your state of both what incentive programs are out there? Um, definitely uh, trying to make sure that whatever you do create aligns with the requirements to uh, access incentives through the IRA. Um, and then just, you know, what are the needs of, of your communities? And, and, you know, is it, are you going to be reaching out to um, doing outreach to, for example, in Connecticut, our work with affordable housing providers or um, other community groups? Is it restaurants like uh, in New Orleans? 
Um, so that's that's one of the things we could recommend from our experience. But I'd be curious to hear from our panelists if you all have any thoughts. I, I can offer a few. I, I, I think it's really important to take a survey of what's happening in other states. And I and I don't know, you know, what agency that the question was coming from, if it was from a public utilities commission or something else. But the uh, there's a lot of really great work happening in some other states. Um, in particular, I would I would look at what um, Green Mountain Power is doing in the state of Vermont. That's a utility. Green Mountain Power is a utility. But if you can get a state level program that looks a lot like what Green Mountain Power is doing in Vermont, you will be a huge winner. <laughs> They're basically deploying solar solar microgrids for residential customers. Um, there's some really good stuff happening in New York, New York and New Jersey. Um, and I know that there's a lot of other states too. So it, these are just the ones that I'm most familiar with. Uh, and there's some good stuff happening in California and in Hawaii. So those are the states that I personally could say, you know, those are worth looking at. Um, uh, but I would do a survey of what's happening around the country. So you're not necessarily inventing anything new and you're modeling off of really good tried and true um, programs that have empirical data behind them? Um, for me, I would view it from um, the lens of the community. Um, it really makes sense to like hear the voice of the community members and know what's going on within the community so you can know what to address, what's gonna have the biggest impact because if you're doing different projects and it doesn't like, really benefit the community in the time of need to me i feel like it's pointless so just hearing the voice of the community and, and everybody coming to collectively as a whole when we're doing these different types of projects yeah i think it was well said by both of them so i won't add anything further awesome and then i do have a follow-up for you anthony actually um is there a is there any plan to make a kit um, as well in your expansion, or would that go against the objective of identifying the needs first? Yeah, so that's um, that is a good question. Uh, it really depends on what, like you said, the family needs are. Making sure that we're not trying to come in with a solution because obviously that is um, goes against being able to make these families energy resilient because they really need to be familiar with what they're getting and then be able to, to use it for uh, many, many years. So we don't want to just try and design something as, um, you know, basically a, um, a system that meets all families, but rather trying to, to make sure that it, it meets each of those families individually. But that doesn't mean that a kit couldn't be a solution for them. We are, um, meeting with one particular uh, gentleman who only needs you know maybe a couple lights and you know like a coffee maker or something like that for his uh, small hogan which is his dwelling for his homestead so um, that allows us to really have flexibility on how we approach uh, these energy assessments and making sure that we're uh, delivering for that particular family and what their needs are Thanks, Anthony. Um, so this, I think, well, I, we, I guess it'll likely most likely go to Craig, but um, I'm curious if any of you have had experience with uh, utility demand response or capacity programs and how those have uh, kind of impacted the economics of your projects and, and the economics of uh, the battery in particular. Well, I'll take the first cut at that. The um, If you re recall from my economics, uh, my economic analysis slides at the very end of my presentation, there was there were two bars and then there was a plus sign, a green plus sign on the far right of, of the bar, on the right side of the bars. And the plus sign is, is basically to say that there are going to be utility programs and maybe even state level programs that allow you to monetize that battery by, you know, operating them in a certain way, you know, in response to demand response calls and 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 other grid services uh the, the the challenge right now is that those programs are not very well defined and so while we believe the clean ocean believes there will be some substantial value there we just don't know how much it is so we can't put any hard dollars into our economic analyses around those um but but you know we do believe that those those 
opportunities will come and they'll be coming you know over the next few years uh, but even in california where people think that a lot of those programs already exist they don't really like the 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 part the cost of participating in those programs is probably more than you're going to make in by actually participating in the program right now if you're a small player if you're if you're a big player yeah the, you can monetize that in, in a favorable way but if you're a small player like most of these projects we're talking about here today the uh, it's very hard to to monetize those it's not it's not very convenient or um clear there's a lot of a lot of cost just basically just in research and and getting set up and confusion about how to actually operate so uh, it's coming it is in my understanding of the marketplaces it's not really there yet But the economics work really beautifully in in most cases that the clinician analyzes without that right just in the form of bill savings you're usually you're usually in a very favorable economic situation just from bill savings alone and then if you tack on if you put on top of that the value of resilience assuming that it's a solar microgrid design and you can provide resilience when the grid goes down then it's just that's just gravy so anything else be above and beyond those two value streams is just going to be even more gravy I have to do everything that Greg said. You hit the needle on the head. <laughs> awesome. Uh, one quick clarification, the Technical Assistance Fund is a nationwide program, so we support communities across the country, um, including uh, DC and Puerto Rico. I have a question for Anthony. Um, they say you mentioned something had failed. Um, and they were wondering what that is. I'm not remembering from your presentation what they're referring to. Um, yeah, I can't remember either. Um, if I did say that, then I apologize. <laughs> Nothing's failed yet. Um, we're making sure that that doesn't happen, so. Uh, Anthony, uh, I believe they're asking about the system that was already installed and failure of that. Oh, yes, so. yes. Thank you, uh, Amit. Um, so they were, um, the families that we've often went to have had various um, PV plus storage systems that were set up in the early 2000s. And these uh, companies that put those up only set them up for a one-time deal. So trying to set these up for the families, but then not coming back to maintain them was a big issue in the early 2000s because a lot of them started failing one after the other. and so. What you'll notice is when you go to these off-grid family homesteads, you'll see that there's solar panels that are set up and there's uh, you know, lead acid batteries that are um, uh, accompanying them, but they're no longer in operation. And so you might be wondering, okay, why do they have this and why is no one taking care of it? And that's because no one's came back to actually fix it. And they haven't taught the families how to actually maintain them either. And so that's what we're trying to uh, step back from and actually design it in a way that would be easy to maintain for these families. And then also finding opportunities to train them later on so that they could possibly get employment opportunities to then set it up for other families so that they're not left with uh, the situation that they were left with in the early 2000s because obviously it leaves them worse off than they were to begin with. So uh, yeah, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Well, uh, to add to Anthony's uh, point about failures, another thing to be uh, taken into account is that typical uh, life of the battery and the inverter is about, give or take about one half of the life of the panel, rated life. So we have to take into account that about halfway through the life of panel, there will be requirement for uh, replacing these. And at the same time, we have to account for the cost for that and everything in the future as well. Uh, we haven't accounted for that yet, but we are cognitive of that. And um, uh, that, that's one of the other things that would be, quote unquote, be a failure if it is not attended to in a timely manner. Okay, thank you, Anthony and Amit. Um, so uh, we're, I know we're getting close to the top, or not the top of the hour, but to 2.30 when um, we wrap things up. But I did want to make sure, you know, both Denise and Anthony, and um, I think Craig, you may have mentioned it as well, but 
Um, all of you had mentioned workforce development and how um, you're able to look at workforce development um, and incorporate that into your assessments. Um, so if you know any of you could speak to um, that experience and, and if you have any recommendations for how um, to make workforce development more a part of the solar and storage conversation and, and part of these projects, um, that'd be really helpful. Um, from my side of things, it's a little bit different because going out into the communities who are pretty much the last to kind of like get knowledge and resources about new things that are happening. So in actually going out and recruiting and also putting that knowledge into the community is really not that easy. But I would say um, just to stay on top of it, um, having like information sessions where people can actually understand it all from the whole picture, right? And that's kind of like in my situation through Get Lit, Stay Lit, like everyone, when you tell them like this is an opportunity to have a job um, or a career pathway, but when they kind of really don't understand it, it kind of makes them kind of push back away from it. Um, so just being proactive and engaging and just giving out the information as far as whatever your project is and just keeping the community informed. I, I'm going to add that the, the Clean Coalition has done a lot of work in disadvantaged communities and we're always aiming to partner with local nonprofits that are, are and, and Clean Coalition is a, a nonprofit too, but we're, we're always aiming to partner with entities like Grid Alternatives. And I think I think Anthony mentioned Grid Alternatives in, in his slides. Um, you know, there's there are are, are are nonprofits that really focus on getting you know into the community. Obviously, Denise is you know uh, is all about the community, and so that's that is a, such a valuable nonprofit to be working with because you do really have to engage with the community and. And I just add that at the kind of the macroeconomic level, the Clean Coalition has done a lot of analysis of where the economic benefits flow to when you do a renewable energy project or a distributed energy resources project, which is a local energy related project. Uh, the, the over 50% of the economic benefits flow to the community where those where those projects are deployed. And doesn't matter whether you're talking about solar batteries, electric vehicle charging infrastructure, if, if it costs $10 million to deploy the system, you're gonna have at least $5 million of that 10 million is going to flow to the local community in the form, largely in the form of local wages. So if you're looking to do economic development, the very first thing you need to do is make sure that those projects are getting to the, 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 the loca localities where you wanna have economic stimulation happening. And that's really important and to the state level people out there, you know, that's a really easy way to make sure your programs are targeted toward disadvantaged communities and making sure that that economic benefit is stimulating those regions. Yeah, and to go along with that, I think it's really important to also go to, uh, especially within indigenous communities, the actual uh, chapter meetings where a lot of these communities meet together to discuss uh, certain problems that they have within their communities, certain things that need to be addressed that's where it becomes important to actually show your face, to show that you care, you're willing to go to meet with those families and actually uh, provide them with a solution that would be beneficial for them. And then we also have to remember that some of these families um, you know, may learn things differently, more hands-on. Um, you don't wanna make it too technical, but try and find ways that you can really make it approachable and a learning experience for everyone that's involved. Wonderful. Thank you so much for all of you for spending your time and investing your wisdom into these conversations. Thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. We have hit 2.31 Eastern time. So this is the conclusion of our webinar today. Everyone um, who signed up for this, this um, webinar will be receiving an email with a copy of the recording as well as the webinar slides and our panelist bios, which again, I hope everyone reads into um, their varied experiences. Um, and you can also check out our website for any upcoming webinars, as well as a vault of webinars from the past 10, 15 years of resources. I hope everyone has a great rest of their day.